So for those of you that don't, don't know me, my name is Joe Minicosi. I'm from Asheville, North Carolina. Um, our company is called uh, Urban3, and we focus on the economics of urbanism. Um, our firm, we tend to think of ourselves as urban designers uh, looking at design, but we do it with a different way. We use a mathematical method of looking at economics to explain uh, land use decisions. Um, and before I start, I want to just go ahead and do a little reading, just a short one, from this book by Charlie LaDuff about Detroit. And I really think that it's prescient for what we're all doing here and what we all do back when we go home, um, which is focus on what our cities do. And uh, in this book, Charlie Duff, LaDuff starts out and he says, and this is about Detroit, and it is awful here. There's no other way to say it. But I believe that Detroit is America's city. It was a vanguard on our way up, just as it is a vanguard on our way down. And one of the homes of the vanguard is on our way up again. Detroit is Pax Americana. It is the birthplace of mass production, the automobile, the cement road, the refrigerator, frozen peas, high paid blue collar jobs, home ownership, and credit on a mass scale. America's way of life was built here. But Detroit can no longer be ignored because what is happening here is happening out there. Neighborhoods from Phoenix to Los Angeles to Miami are blighted and with empty houses with people with idle hands. Go ahead, laugh at Detroit because you're laughing at yourself. And this is a picture of Charlie, Charlie playing golf through Detroit. Um, you know, there's a lot that when we look at cities, we see the same patterns over and over again. And it's all stuff that we can easily deal with. It's all information that's hiding in plain sight. And how you present that information can help you in your course to seeing your city and keeping it away from other paths that other cities have gone down. Um, our company was birthed by a real estate developer, um, Julian Price in the upper left. And the role of what we were doing in, in Asheville, North Carolina, was fixing buildings. Um, we put 75% of our money into the sticks and bricks, fixing up the buildings, and 25% into seeding businesses. It was about understanding the cash flow of these buildings, these buildings that are sitting inside cities, and how do they function with the whole community. So this is one of our buildings before and after. Now to make this happen, and to put housing downtown, you have to do math. We have to understand what it costs to do this project and what it yields to us to be able to do the next building. But to the city, it's got, it's got the same effect. So we found ourselves constantly talking to our elected officials about what it means to them. What does it mean to a city and to other citizens when we do or when we rehab a building? It's not just about us. We're paying taxes to everybody, right? So why we do that is because there's, it is absolutely indistinguishable between a citizen and a corporation, our business, that we have to cash flow. And if you look at the word incorporate in the, in the Oxford American Dictionary, it says it right there. It says to constitute a company a city or other organization is a legal corporation. So for the elected officials in the room, you all are on the board of directors of a multi-billion dollar corporation. And that's what you have to think about, is how does this cash flow? What are the effects of our decisions on the ground and how we build the city? And how does it pay its way back? So my city, Asheville, is a finite boundary of land. The acres that we have, our state has made it illegal for us to annex. So those acres that we have within it is our crop to cultivate. When a farmer has uh, a, a, a farm, the farmer's thinking of that economically. The, the farmer's thinking about the crop yield per acre, the water per acre, the fertilizer per acre, and then what comes out and how it yields in the marketplace. They don't just go out and till everything, right? So if cities are doing the same thing, we'd look at our land like a farmer, we'd see a different city. So my city is worth $12.8 billion. That's its taxable value. Let that wash over you for a second. $12.8 billion. That's little old Asheville, which is 90,000 people. So my city is four times the value of this guy. Right? <laughs> Perhaps for the rest of the presentation. So if he could want to run around talking about money, shouldn't my mayor, right? I mean, or more closer to home, um, my city is two times the value of this guy. And could you expect Dan Gilbert to make decisions about his cash flow without ever looking at numbers, without ever seeing a spreadsheet? Of course not. So yet, how do cities, time and time again, we talk about emotive things, we talk about what makes us feel good without ever seeing the data. I can't wear this hat too long, so. <laughs> Y'all get that? So, yeah. so if we look at this as a land product, this is, this is one of our buildings. Um, so we made a... Uh, Took it from this state over here on the left, we put some housing, some office, some retail. 
Um, some citizens complained because the city did a streetscape project in front of our building. So we got a garbage can, a bike rack, two benches, and a street tree. Thank you, City of Asheville. That's awesome. Uh, that subsidy at our front door. We took this building from $300,000 to $11 million of value. That represents a 3,500% increase in taxes on that property. Anybody in this room have a 401k plan that grows by 3,500%? Wouldn't that be awesome? Right? So it, the crop yield on that just shot through the roof. And, and people say to me, like, well, well, Joe, that's that's cool. That's $11 million. We've got this Walmart over here at 20. So Walmart pays $220,000 in property taxes. A significant sum. That's my house on the right. Uh, those are my dogs. They think they're lions. But we pay $2,000 in taxes. We sit on a tenth of an acre. So if a one-acre cookie cutter fell into my neighborhood and grabbed 10 houses, each paying 2000 bucks or about $20,000 an acre. Y'all follow me? So that's the, that's the yield in my neighborhood, $20,000 an acre. If we take that one acre cookie cutter, fly it in space and drop it on the Walmart and divide its tax bill by the 34 acres that it sits on, this is what it's producing per acre. What about our building? Now if you had an acre of our building, of the downtown building, this is what you get. So these are the numbers. This is not hard to do. It's just doing a simple productivity analysis to understand the cash flow. I was presenting this in Colorado, and I was like, let me make it simple for you folks in Colorado. If you had an acre of land to grow something in Colorado, what are you going to grow? <laughs> and, uh, and it still works in California, Hawaii. It works in North Carolina, even though it's illegal, but that's North Carolina. So, I mean, y'all get it? It's cash crops, right? And so what's comical is people say to me, they're like, well, you know, Joe, we take the losses in property taxes for the retail gains. All right, fair enough. Let's remove my house because I don't sell anything. Let's do the retail taxes. When you run the numbers, Walmart sells a significant amount of stuff, but the city gets a portion of a portion of that. So 27% of the eight cent sales tax, or a total of 47,000 an acre uh, in retail taxes, which is more than the property taxes, but when you add the two of them together, the combined net effect of taxation on that Walmart is about $51,000 an acre. Now look at our building, that's just the property taxes the city gets per acre out of our building. To be fair, we have retail in that building, so that's another, bumps it up to 414, now you're cooking with gas. Jobs per acre, everybody's concerned about jobs, right? Even though our building's a residential building, we have jobs in it. That's another 74 jobs per acre versus Walmart 6. So these numbers are there, you just have to make things apples to apples so they see that, right? Um, when you stack it up side by side, we even have residential per acre at 90 units an acre versus their zero. And this is all stuff that intuitively we understand about cities and urbanism. We've been building for tens of thousands of years, but the data is there to support it. So conversely, we've put policies in place that actually incentivize the alternative. We tend to think of all about all, all, uh, incentives as some meeting that I come to as a developer. I ask you all to get rid of your zoning so I can do something. And then I get a, a, a get out of zoning free card or something. That's an incentive. But just by how you set up policies, um, you, you create incentives. And I just want you to realize this isn't complex math that I'm doing here. Uh, I'm trained as an architect. This is fifth grade division. We already do this for productivity of cars. Could you imagine if, if we judged cars on the miles per tank? Right? Yeah. We'd all be driving Ford F-150s at 650 miles per tank. You'd say to me, Joe, that's stupid. Um, tanks are all different sizes. Gallons of gas is what drives the car, so we say miles per gallon. And oh, look at that, the numbers changed. We should all be driving BMW Suds. You know, I, I'm being cute here with a joke, but I want you to understand we already have this nomenclature in the way that we look at things. Just apply it to real estate. And we get, we get lost in these numbers. We see a $20 million Walmart and everybody gets stars in their eyes because $20 million is a lot of money. But we never make it comparative. So we've done this all across the country. We've done it in Canada and New Zealand. And, and with the same pattern emerges. For every dollar of county taxes somebody's paying out in the county, to the county, somebody in the city's paying about five bucks. The Walmart's about seven. The mall's at nine. And as soon as you get to a two-story building, this could be in downtown Driggs, Idaho, or downtown Durham, North Carolina. It really doesn't matter. As soon as you start stacking those stories, you're stacking your dollar bills. And on the, on the right is only a six-story building, so we're not talking skyscrapers here. And the math is there if you just look at your community that way. Just change the perspective of how you look at it. Now, people say to me, they're like, Joe, that's kind of simple. How did we not discover this? And my answer is, we didn't discover wheels to put on luggage until 1972. We actually put a man on the moon before we discovered wheels for luggage. Right? Did we not know what a wheel was? Or did we not know? 
you know, sometimes the simple stuff is hard to come by, and we just try to help people through that. And this actually goes back to Ian McCarr. He nailed it in a book called Design with Nature from 1967. Um, and I love this, what he says. He says, money is our measure. Now, again, Ian McCarr being who he is, he couldn't stop himself. He loves to pick on America. And he follows that with convenience of the cohort, the short term expand, and may the devil take the hindmost of its morality. It's kind, of, it's kind of right. But in a way, he was leading us down that path. If you can look at your world with a different data perspective, you can see a different reality. And we, we're familiar with this, right? You can do an MRI to see what's going on inside your head. I mean, hell, I can show you what's inside an earthworm. So why not look at your city with a different lens or a different perspective? Can you take a different data to the table? Could you imagine having surgery without ever looking at an x-ray or an MRI? Of course not. So why aren't we making decisions about our city without, without understanding the finances? So we're taking the city and moving it aside, we can do things with GIS technology. We can do the layers, the infrastructure layer, the buildings are built on that infrastructure layer, right? We can map the ologies, the hydrology, the geology. We can see this stuff. But what we like to do is split the difference between nature and the man-made, and I want to show you the economic reality of your place. Can I give you that picture of what you look like financially? So let's go back to Asheville for a second. This is typically how people look at the county and they look at real estate. So you see, um, this is the Biltmore Estate down here, and purple means hot, high value. Gray is non-taxable, so this is a big federal park up here in the upper right, so it's not paying taxes, so well, just to be... Just to be crude about it, it's not paying taxes, I don't care about it, right? So, <laughs> so um, you got the Biltmore Estate, that's $100 million. It's America's largest house. Well, yeah, that's pretty important. When Mr. Cecil shows up at one of our community meetings, he's the heir to the Biltmore Estate, everybody genuflects and thanks him for his time, right? $100 million house. No one in here has a $100 million house. So, but that's not a fair way of looking at it. He's got 8,000 acres under control. He's got the biggest house in America. So he's got the biggest gas tank. So rather than look at things as a total value, let's say value per acre, and oh look, the map changes. Let me just show it to you in 3D. Can you all tell me where downtown Asheville might possibly be? <laughs> so not only are you seeing the scale of that investment, but you're seeing it vertically in the, it's not only heights and shoulders above downtown, it's leaps and bounds above the rest of the community, right? There's other lessons here. You look off to the right with Black Mountain, that's a little town of about 12,000 people. And you see their main street operating the same way that our downtown does. So if downtown is mama bear, that's baby bear, right? The same form, it's just at a different place in time. So that, that, that economics is there to make that argument of the stuff that's good for us from a health standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, it's also better for us from a financial standpoint. And we just try to get people to see that. So Canada, uh, their tax system's a little bit different. Um, I was trying to explain their tax system to the Canadians versus ours. Ours is like that 1970s equalizer up there, and theirs is like the subcourt in our nightclub. You know, it's, they got a lot more levers and knobs, but it yields the same results, which means that they're actually more sophisticated about how they look at government versus Americans. So for those of you that are from Canada, you guys are awesome. For those of you that don't understand Canada, please learn about it. They're way ahead of us from a policy standpoint. But their financial model of their city, this is Guelph, Ontario, again, same thing. You can see where downtown is, and you can see the productivity of their downtown. Most of their downtown is about three stories tall. And you see this incredible growth of value out of it. So it's highly productive. Um, Auckland, New Zealand, um, this is their model. And what's interesting about Auckland is they essentially have a container around the city because they have a growth boundary. But you see different results uh, here, in particular. This is a TOD. This is another one. And so I asked them, I said, well, why don't you, you should have, if this is Jupiter and these are the moons around it, you should have other TODs equidistant on this side. And they said, oh yeah, we've got a problem. The highway cuts off that section of the city. So you can very easily see the opportunity that's there if you connect that neighborhood. Do you, do you all get this? Is this too nerdy? Is this, <laughs> sorry? All right. So there's other ways of looking at communities. We did Austin, Texas. Again, anybody want to take a guess where downtown Austin is? Um, and it's amazing the, the potency. But we find things like, particularly for those of you that are interested in, in historic preservation, those old buildings that are with us, that have been with us for hundreds of years. Uh, this building in particular is one of my favorites. Here it is on a postcard. I mean, there's a damn horse in front of this building. 1912 it was built, it's 11 stories tall, and it's producing a value of about $60 million an acre in value. To put that in perspective, here's the Walmart down here in the lower left, at 800,000. 
So let that wash over you for a second. That Walmart is not going to be here 100 years from now. This building that's producing $60 million of value from a productivity standpoint will be here in 100, another 100 years. It's been in the portfolio 100 years already. So this stuff, and it's, it's, it's what they're paying in taxes. I'm not making it up. That's its value. So if you had 1.1 acres of that little three-story building on the top, it would equal the 20-acre Walmart in value, apples to apples. Is it really that hard to do an acre of those three-story buildings? And again, this is stuff that's data that's already, you guys got awfully quiet. Is this, <laughs> is this offensive? Are you cool about this? Wonderful. Thanks. Uh, you know, it's just, I just hope I don't get too off the deep end on this. Um, we're doing Charleston, South Carolina right now. Um, what's fascinating about Charleston, again, you can see where the old city is. What's phenomenal about this, just pulling out the buildings that predate our Constitution. Let this wash over you for a second. They've got buildings that predate our U.S. Constitution. Those buildings contribute $670,000 a year just in county property taxes. So those buildings have been contributing $670,000 $670, to the county for over 240 years. And so those are the buildings you put out postcards. Those are the buildings that, that you visit, they take pictures of. That's the value of that place. Um, and you can see it writ large in this model. Just pulling out the buildings that are over three stories tall, they pre which is 0.7% of the entire county, they produce 10% of the county's value. So when you see where you're getting your wealth, you're finding it time and time again in that core area of your downtown. That value that our predecessors left for us. So it wasn't some lost civilization of people that made Charleston. It's not like Martians made it. These are Americans that were there, right? So retail sales, uh, for those of you that are from Colorado, uh, California, Louisiana, there's, there's different states that operate off retail taxes. Um, this is a map of all of the states, and red is property taxes at a municipal level. Green is retail. You generally don't want to be on the right end of the, of the ledger um, in and around the Louisiana, Alabama, Arkansas area because you're tied to retail transactions to run a city. So when people lose their jobs, they spend less and it becomes more difficult to run your city. But that's the fact of the way the different states operate. So for those states that have retail taxes, um, this is Texas. This is, oh, by the way, this is Austin's mixed beverage sales. We mapped how much they drink. This was kind of cool. Um, <laughs> I was presenting this at 8 o'clock in the morning uh, in front of like 400 people, and I asked who this uh, 78704 zip code was, and there was a table in the back of the room, and they're all like, woo! <laughs> and I was like, you guys are impressive. Like, that's, that's the college down here. Like, you guys are drinking more than college students, and they're all like, woo! And I'm pretty excited. That's the doubt. Um, retail sales in, in Austin, this was kind of phenomenal. This is where the malls are in that belly, and you see downtown, again, blowing past them, and it's not just in Austin, Texas. We've seen this in Austin, Syracuse, New York, the downtown blew away the mall, um, Nashville, anywhere we run this data, we see it. Back to Colorado for a second, little old Durango. This is their property tax production. You see their little downtown killing it. This thing on the south is called South Durango, is uh, the mall, the, the Walmart, the Home Depot, all that stuff. Um, almost monolithically, monolithically commercial. So they're like, well, it's not doing well on property taxes, but it can do better at retail taxes. And we modeled it, sure enough. Not as good as downtown. Um, total productivity, jobs. I mean, everything downtown was a leading indicator. Um, and just to kind of mash it up and put them side by side, and blue is the downtown, and beige is South Durango. So this is the retail sales productivity of both of them side by side. This is the county taxes of both of them side by side. But just to be fair, let's compare the land area of both of them. So downtown's only taking up one third the area of land, yet it's almost as productive in total taxes. So we said to them, just add 8.3 8 acres of more downtown. Just do more of that. If it's already working, just do a little bit more of it, and you'll catch up in all the retail sales. You know, when you look deeper at the data, it shows you a different story. When you look at the retail taxes over time, even, um, in red is the downtown, and blue is South Durango. So here's downtown, here's South Durango. So back before the recession, downtown was about this much, and so it was about 86% of South Durango. And through the recession, downtown actually grew to catch up to South Durango, almost 91%. And so we asked the next question, which is, did downtown add more buildings than South Durango that it actually caught up in retail sales? And when you look at the data, 
you saw that downtown only added 17,000 square feet of new buildings, while South Durango was adding 300,000. Did y'all get this? This is potency, right? The, that little square foot that you add of downtown is, is producing more wealth for your community than the big box stuff, which is monolithically retail. If we can get past our biases and just let the data show us what's going on, we look at the world with completely new eyes, right? So making things apples to apples is critically important. Just to drill a little deeper, we had two business owners in Durango share their books with us. Um, the, the bookstore and um, the coffee shop. Um, and it was, you know, they, they opened it up. They showed us what their taxes were, what they're producing per acre versus Walmart, um, and property taxes, and also retail sales. So those two little businesses that people walk by are actually killing it from a retail tax productivity standpoint, even jobs. So let me ask you a question. Who's funding the Little League team? Who's hiring a local attorney? Who's hiring a local accounting firm or a local ad executive? It's those small businesses on Main Street. We're not giving them the time of the day because we're not looking at them in a comparative way. Did y'all get this? So some people ask me, like, Joe, dude, what's your deal, man? Do you, do you hate Walmart? Like, what's your problem? And, and I don't. You know, actually, I'm going to give you a little story. I, I attended um, the International Association of Assessing Officers, the conference for all tax assessors, which makes this conference feel like Burning Man. By comparison. <laughs> they're good people, trust me, but it's, it's a painfully boring conference. But um, Mr. Terrell, the head of real estate for Walmart, he's actually the director of property tax for Walmart, did this unbelievable presentation. He got up and presented in front of all of the assessors for our country and Canada and presented how cheap his buildings were. So he's standing up there with, a, with spreadsheet after spreadsheet showing how cheap his buildings were. He starts handing out business cards. He's like, look, if you want to know how cheap our buildings are, just call me. We'll share with you our bid tabs with all of our general, all of our general contractors. If you think we beat up Procter & Gamble, you need to see what we do to our general contractors. We made the cheapest buildings possible. Now, the, the, the assessors are agnostic. If he's building a pile of crap, it's a pile of crap. They can't make value there. So they're taking notes. They're taking his cards. Now, as somebody that works in real estate, I was like, wow, this is brilliant. He's getting all of his tax bills dropped in one meeting. As a citizen, my heart was collapsing because that's all I heard him do was yell, I'm paying as low taxes as possible and I'm watching everybody help him out with that. But I don't hate the player. It's the game, right? I don't fault Mr. Terrell for doing this. These are our policies. So I went up to the microphone afterward, uh, after, during Q&A, and I asked him, I said, what's the useful life of one of your buildings? He's like, 15 years. We'll be out of that building in 15 years, maybe 20. Again, it's your community. It's your corporation. If you're cool with a 15-year investment, good on you. right? Understand the effects of that in the relationship. And just make sure you account for it. So uh, Chattanooga, we did an analysis. This is their downtown. Across the river, there's this uh, zone that's been revitalizing. This developer came in and wanted to do a grocery store. This is a Publix grocery store. Publix is out of the southeast. It's a sub-regional chain. This developer from Atlanta was like, I'm going to bring a grocery store. I'm going to bring jobs. You need to get rid of all of your urban design guidelines because I'm bringing jobs, right? So the mayor is just going to get rid of all the zoning requirements for the site, all these urban design guidelines for walkability. Well, around the site, they already have people that have made those urban investments. You have some mixed-use buildings here. You have an urban grocer that did like a, a Whole Foods kind of style, but in an urban format there, you have townhouses. So we have the ingredients of urbanism that you'll hear about throughout this conference, right? All the typologies of buildings. It's already happening. So this developer wants to go suburban in this urban location and do this. So they already have those comps. We could just go and grab them in the marketplace already. Um, we know what they are. We can find their value. These are the mixed-use buildings on the right. It's a uh, office above retail. On the left, it's residential above retail. We're not grabbing something from Boston. It's like right here, right down the street. Um, this is the urban grocer that the local guy did. So it's uh, it's called a deep throat model, where you have a big box and then you kind of glue on this two-story building. This is like yoga studios and Pilates or something, and this is like a dog beauty salon or whatever. But they made it feel a little bit more urban, and that's cool. Publix has done some crazy urban stuff. Again, you can find all of this stuff online and you can go into the assessor files and pull their data. This is a, 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 a Publix grocery store in Miami Beach that's got parking on the roof, two layers of parking. It looks like a UFO hit it, but it's really like a conveyor belt to get you to your car. They know urban. This is a small footprint Publix. 
Uh, it's called a hybrid model where you have a pedestrian front and you have a suburban back. So you have a, a parking lot in the back that's level and you have your pedestrian front here. So here's the site, 34 foot of grade change. Here's what the developer's proposing. And because we wanted people to see it in 3D, we made this really crude SketchUp model. Don't be fussy about it, just do what conveys the information. So we wanted people to see that all of these houses up here now get to look at a tarmac of a roof, and here's your quarter mile long future graffiti wall because they're leveling the site. That's the reality. Well, we're also running the taxes. You can see them here on the lower left, but I'll come back to that. So what if you just did Urban Design 101? What if you met your Urban Design guidelines? This is what it would look like. You'd have housing facing housing, do something of a higher density, maybe some townhouses, put a couple of mixed-use buildings down in the corner, call it a day. This is the most basic Urban Design 101. Here's what you get. Um, go crazy, do, or sorry, do a better site design, do what the local guy did, move the building up against the street, um, and then here's what it looks like. Uh, ring the whole site with a crust of mixed uses. Go crazy, do Miami Beach. You've got 34 foot of grade change, just drive right up on the damn roof, you don't have to build a ramp. Um, densify the heck out of it, this is what you get. This is a little bit of wild stuff. Back it down to West Palm Beach, small footprint, uh, mix of uses, big parking lot, this is what you get. And then let's say you irritate the developer, the developer goes back to Atlanta, I hope the developer's not in the room. I apologize if you are. This is just reality, sorry. Um, the developer leaves and goes back to Atlanta and you just get, you just get to what's already happening in the neighborhood. Townhouses and mixed use development, right? All right, that's what it is. So let's recap. Today it's paying $13,000 to the city in taxes. It's a fallow site, it's kind of empty. If you just do what the developer's proposing, the mayor's right, you're gonna get three times more taxes. That's a reality, that's, that's gonna happen, right? Um, but if you, when a, when a developer does development, like if I'm doing development in your community, I'm gonna do an opportunity cost model, I'm gonna check out all my options in, in your community, and I'm gonna do math on figuring out what works for me financially, right? And I'm not doing just one design. I'll do several designs before I get to you. If we did the same thing with the city, if we said, okay, developer, you're bringing a project to me and you're asking me to get rid of rules. If I get rid of rules and goals, that's a cost to me. So since we're now in this relationship where we're partners, because you can't do your building without us, I want to see what I lose. So I'm going to do my opportunity cost to see what my options are. So this is the first opportunity. That, that's Urban Design 101. We could have $154,000 a year in taxes here, right? Now, a better site design, and so for the designers in the room, this is the value of good design. You can actually create more value in a site. It's true. Design is worth something. Um, now, if you go crazy and do Miami Beach, if you densify the heck out of it, of course, the numbers shoot through the roof, back it down to West Palm Beach, in your no-build scenario. Did you all get this? So this is the taxes that are the opportunity for the community. And the developer is asking to get rid of your opportunities. So if we just take two of these and just say, let's just look at them side by side, here they are. Now the reality of these numbers that I showed you is that's not the real numbers, that's just one year. When you make this decision, much like what Mr. Walmart said, 15 years, right? Now grocery stores are somewhere around 20, sometimes 40 years. But let's just stick it at 20 years. Let's look at that net effect over 20 years to see the real net present value of all of that decision. So this is what the numbers really are. So what you're doing is you're taking an opportunity to go from $300,000 to $900,000. You're gonna gain $600,000 in new taxes to your community, right? That's cash. But you're foregoing five million. You could reach in your pocket, give the developer two million bucks, and say here's two million dollars, just make it happen, and you'll be ahead of the game by $2.2 .2 million. So the reason why I'm showing you all this is that I want you to realize that for decades we've been making decisions without looking at this information. And part of the problem that you have right now, when you can't afford the Greenway, or the art teacher, or the dancing traffic cop, you all got dancing traffic cops? <laughs> so when you don't have that money, when you go to City Hall and you say, hey, we want to do a Greenway, and City Hall's like, we're broke. It's not that they're broke, it's that they've made past decisions that have disabled their ability to grow their wealth. Did y'all get this? So this is, this is the cash flow of what's going on in these decisions, and you have to account for that going forward. And just be aware that these, you, know, you can't change the past, but just be accounting, accounting for it. So how does this all net its way out? So in any business, you have costs and you have revenue. So if we're to look at the whole thing, we did this project in High Point, 
um, of how to think this forward. How do you, if you do a project, how do you cultivate, will it pay for itself? So um, uh, High Point's not in a good situation. Um, it's essentially declining in value. It's one of the few North Carolina cities that's actually fallen through the floor. Um, and so they really got to think differently about where they're going. They did a, a plan with 20 Plater Zyberg, and we weren't involved in that. We just, we said, look, do your plan, and just come to us, and we'll figure out what its future value is. So in black are all the infill buildings. They want to cultivate a new downtown, because their downtown is sort of trapped in time because of, they have this thing called the furniture market that just basically wipes out downtown. So they actually have within their market, and you'll, there's plenty of experts here in this conference that do market data analysis. But generally speaking, and also the National Association of Realtors published this, about 24% of any marketplace would choose that urbanized product if it existed. If you build that environment, there are people that want that, straight in the marketplace. So that's about 26,000 people in the High Point market area. Now, realistically, High Point could go after the whole metropolitan area demand, which is about 176,000. But let's just be conservative about it. They have 26,000 people that would want that product. So it's clearly going to happen if they build it. It's only a couple hundred units that they're building. But here they are, small, modest, little infill buildings. Um, but here's what, here's what happens over time. Isolating the downtown in that little area that's next to downtown, which is on the left here. As they start building buildings here, the value grows and it eventually catches up to downtown. So they can actually harvest new wealth in their community. So if you look at that harvesting, in the red is their value that's sliding downhill. We just were, went ahead and said, okay, you're not going to lose value anymore. We're just going to stabilize you and just assume that you don't lose money. And that's the dotted line. So all the new projects when they come in, like let's say if you build a building in, pointer here, if you build a building in 2017, it's going to bump up new taxes. Once it gets built, it's paying new taxes. So this is all, this triangle here is all new taxes, about $1.2 million. Now when you fix a main street, it actually affects the neighborhood adjacent to it. That becomes a more desirable place too. That's going to have a ripple effect of another $1.1 million. So they're actually able to cultivate more wealth of a total of $2.3 million. So we asked them, we said, all right, what's the cost of that street? I don't know what the street's cost, so what is it? And they said it's a million dollars. Okay, so you all win a popularity contest, and you're managing a corporation called High Point. Let me give you a math problem. Is it worth it for you to spend a million dollars to gain 2.3? Yes. I do the project. You know, it's, if we do the math on this stuff, we can actually see that there's a net effect positive. Um, just to kind of take it full swing, in Lafayette, Louisiana, um, the mayor asked us, it was like, look, he's a business guy, he runs, he runs a pet store, um, and he's like, you know, people just don't understand the math. They don't understand we're essentially insolvent, we're going bankrupt. They don't understand the numbers. And so they, uh, they, they asked us to do the analysis on this. We worked with uh, Chuck Marone from Strong Towns. And one of the things that was kind of amazing about our work in this is as we started digging into it, I don't know if Carly's here, but Carly, who uh, was in the city manager's office, gave us these documents. And it was kind of amazing. She's like, yeah, we got broke once before. So in 1994, they actually figured out they were going broke. This is the cover of their budget document from 1994. I think the finance officer was sending a message. Um, so not only is a tsunami going to hit them, the shark going to hit them. And so what do you think the elected officials did when faced with this information? Get that can down the road, right? Undeterred, the next year, the finance officer put this on the cover. Like, hey, did I mention how screwed we are? Now, this is the county government collapsing. And now, you know, the city councilors aren't going to let their county go bankrupt because the citizens of the city are also citizens of the county. So they bailed out the county by doing this joint city-county merger, and oh, now we're all happy. And we asked them, we're like, well, what did you guys do to save money? Did, what did you change in your pattern other than firing the artist from the first two years? Going to Microsoft Clip Art, like, what did you do? And because they never changed their pattern. They just kept on growing the way that they always did. Um, we did their, their model, and you can see downtown is this big purple spike here, and then this is their new urbanism here. And then just taking one ingredient of the city, your pavement. You know, you own that pavement. If I build the development and I build the road, I turn around and give it to you, it's not a gift, 
it's a liability that you have in the future. So if you could count for that um, and take all of their streets and push them together, they, they own, all the streets are essentially one massive parking lot. It's all asphalt, right? In Louisiana, they have to replace the roads every 45 years because they're built on kind of a rubbery soil. Roads shake apart. Um, that is a liability of future generations to repay that. Um, they own six and a half square miles of asphalt. As a parking lot, it will span from Long Island to Manhattan to New Jersey. So Long Island, Manhattan, New Jersey, you can fill all of New York Harbor with what they own in streets. It's about twice the size of Venice or about 12 times the French Quarter. And that's what they have to pay for. 13% of it are in publicly funded driveways. This is a cul-de-sac, and here you see somebody treats it like a driveway. All of this disconnected network, if it's not a network, it shouldn't be paid for by the public. You know, people say, well, Joe, I don't want to have traffic. I don't want to have cars going by. Great. I want to be six foot tall and have a full head of hair. I think you all should pay for that. That'd make me happy. Right? I mean, why do we allow that into the conversation? This is some freedom that you get to put a liability on your entire community. But putting that aside, the old city limits is in gray. The agglomerated county is, or parish is in yellow. When you look at the streets, there's a lot more streets inside the city limits. About two thirds of the streets are in the city limits. But when you look at how it's financed, you see a different picture. That the city's paying for a majority of the streets. So I made a very stupid comment in the public presentation, which is, why don't these two pie charts match? Okay? If you own a third of the infrastructure, why aren't you paying a third? Well, that irritated this counselor, who's uh, running for office at the time. And this is uh, his campaign platform that he sent to the newspaper. And I love this. It's not about where you live, it's about what you believe. Right? We've moved from fact <laughs> to fantasy. <laughs> now, a lot of people in Lafayette are awesome. Uh, Kevin Blanchard, who was the uh, director of public works at the time, responded to this statement by saying this. There's no such thing as an infrastructure ferry. <laughs> and by the way, I love Kevin's title, the world's greatest public works director. That's what he called himself. So we had to Photoshop Kevin in on this one. <laughs> And Kevin's like, dude, they just don't get it. Like, could you make it easier for people? And we're like, all right, we'll try. So taking, taking their city and just freezing it in time in 2015, in blue is all of the revenue that they have for their roads. In red, starting with 1960, when they start taking the roads that we could date and putting it into the system, this is the obligated debt for all of those roads. That's the cost of the roads. Now, as you know, when you build a road in 1960, and we went ahead and extended it to 50 years, 50 years out, you have to rebuild that road. So as you start rebuilding all of those roads, this is what your cash flow starts to look like. So let me ask you something. Do you have enough blue to pay for the red? <laughs> no. Hang on, let me, make it, let me make it a little bit more simple. Do you have enough blue to pay for the red? So not only is the red 18 times the value of the blue, realize that half of that blue is already committed to debt service, which means that those bond agents that you pay to pay for this stuff are going to get their money first. You can't get out of it unless you go bankrupt, and very few cities go bankrupt. Did y'all get that? So what happens is that that bond agency is going to show up, and they're going to take their money, and you're going to have less money for that school teacher, or for that police officer, or fire officer, right? So putting it into the model, this is a side view of the model. We sent everybody a tax bill in red for their infrastructure, and we mapped it against what they're producing in taxes, what's, in the, what's above the line and what's below the line. Any business does this, you net one against the other, are you in the black or in the red, and here's the whole parish in 3D. It looks like the place is bleeding, and just to take the thing and just drop it on the floor so everything pops up vertically, this is what it looks like. And you immediately see those areas that are incredibly upside down financially. The pattern just doesn't work. I don't care if you want it, you're essentially paying people to live in these areas. And the scale of that vertical is the scale of the payment that we're giving them. And we suggested to them, you gotta build more green to pay for the red. It's that simple. But there's things that people want. You know, you're essentially getting that discounted rate for doing the development. That's your subsidy. You're subsidizing that pattern in development. So to put it simple, in 1950, they had 34,000 um, people in their community. They had five feet of pipe per person. And they had 2.4 fire hydrants per thousand. As they've gotten richer, as they've, as they've grown their population to 121,000, they've grown their pipe per person to 50 feet of pipe per person, and their, road, their water infrastructure to 51 fire hydrants per thousand. 
So the numbers are 350% growth, yet you're, going, you're growing your liability by 1,000 and 2,000%. And they told me, and I'm like, look, Joe, we got rich. We got rich, we got oil money. All right, let's check your wealth. So adjusted for today, this is what the household income was in 1950, and here's what it is today. So indeed, they have gotten richer, but only 160% richer, but their liability has grown by thousands of percent. So imagine getting a $1,000 raise and you convince uh, your partner to doing a 40,000 square foot addition on your house. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's not gonna pencil out, right? So they have a serious, serious problem. And what's nice about Lafayette is they're actually staring it in the face in an in a almost 100% humane way. They're actually having an honest conversation about it. That the uh, average house is worth $150,000 and the reality of those numbers are that they're paying about 1,500 bucks in taxes per house. When you actually look at what matriculates out of that tax bill to the roads, it's $150 um, to the road system. The rest of it goes to parks, rec, police, fire, et cetera, right? That's the reality of the cash flow. If you actually pencil out what each person should be putting into a reserve account to those roads on an annual basis, this is what they should be paying per year into their road fund per household. You see a problem yet? Now there's stuff under the roads, right? Those are pipes. They have 55% of their pipes are in clay that have to be replaced. That's another 4,000. And it'd be, I'd be a Pollyanna to say, let's just go ahead and raise everybody's taxes by $7,000 a year. That's just not gonna happen. But what they need to understand is that their model doesn't work. And we just have to be honest about the numbers and put them out there. Did I just depress you all? <laughs> you know, this is, this is a paradigm of how we've been building without accounting for there's a time to pay that piper, that that infrastructure has a useful life to it that falls apart. So, you know, just be aware that this, there's a behavioral economics at play that's in the cash flow. Uh, we're doing an analysis in South Bend right now. Um, you can see they're downtown. This is some new urbanism stuff. It's only about four stories tall next to around the campus. The campus is this big gray area north, north, where Notre Dame is. But taking a look at just their population and their pipes, What's fascinating about their population is they apexed in 1960. So in 1960 was when Detroit stole Packard automobiles and moved them up here, which is when their population started to slide in, in South Bend. So thank you, Detroit, for um, handicapping South Bend, uh, Indiana. But they've stabilized, so they're kind of flatlined. Now here's what's interesting about their pipes through time is that they've grown their system, they've grown their pipes. So as they add people, they add pipes, right? You have to service these folks. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and freeze it around uh, 1960 is when that line comes in. That's when their population stops, but look what happens to their pipes as their population flatlines. And South Bend isn't alone in this. You know, South Bend, uh, Buffalo, New York, there's lots of places that are actually flatlining or stabilizing the population. They're still adding more infrastructure liability to future generations. This doesn't pencil its way out. You can't build your way out of this problem in the same financially upside down situation. So in blue is what their pipes are doing, in red is what their population is doing. And that's straight data that's in the system. Putting their pipes end to end, it will go from South Bend, Indiana to my, town, my house in, in Asheville, North Carolina. It's an amazing amount of infrastructure that they're building. And they're gonna be faced with that reality. So, you know, let's see how much time we got here. So, you know, I know what y'all are thinking right now, which is, Joe, this is America, right? This is what we like to do. We like freedom. We don't want to have neighbors. We want to stretch ourselves out. That's what the market wants, right? I should put this back out when I say that. That's what America wants, right? So what if I could bring you the ghost of Christmas future? What if I could bring you an entire county that 100% bought into that system? And we got it in Gwinnett County, Georgia. And for those of you that don't know Gwinnett County, Georgia, Lawrenceville is the county seat. This place is four hours from Asheville. I had no idea what Lawrenceville was. Um, and uh, it's just this, this county just outside the Atlanta Beltway. When we got the project, we were under explicit orders that we were not allowed to use the word urban, city, town, or municipal in the presentation. <laughs> and I was like, all right, whatever. Um, but when we got their data, it was kind of fascinating. I called up the client, Kelly Brown, and the Chamber of Commerce was our client. I said, I said Kelly, y'all are 800,000 people. You're huge. And she goes, I know, I know honey, oh, yeah. you're huge. And, <laughs> thanks for that, that's awesome. Um, and she goes, yeah, but honey, you need to understand, we're 460 square miles, we're a massive county. 
So I was all right, let's do a little math. What's 800,000 divided by 460? Well, that's about 1,900 people per square mile. That's what density is, right? Which is less dense than DeKalb, which is where Atlanta is. But we had all this other data, so we just showed it to them. And as, as, as we're presenting, I was like, all right, what's going on here where you've got 1,900 people per square mile here? Six, you're 200 people denser than Mecklenburg County. What's in Mecklenburg County? Charlotte. Yeah, Charlotte. How did you guys get denser than Mecklenburg County and not produce a Charlotte? Like a lot more people in this room probably know where Charlotte is, but don't know where Lawrenceville is, right? Or this is Nashville over here. You're 600 people denser than Nashville. Hey, both of these places have professional sports teams. What happened here? Um, here's, here's Travis County. That's a, you're almost double the density of Austin, Raleigh, Asheville. And this is Chapel Hill, North Carolina. That's what a town of 35,000 people, which is the same size as Lawrenceville, that's what a town inside a rural environment looks like. This is called rural, that's called town. What the hell did you guys do? So we did their model. Uh, Josh is sitting over here. I was like sitting next to Josh. I'm like, what the hell is that? Turn it on its side. So Josh turns the model. And I'm like, damn, it's like a 1970s shag carpet. It's just. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they built edge to edge the same pattern of development. This is what we typically see. This is Chapel Hill. You can see Chapel Hill, Carborough, and, and Hillsborough, the three municipalities inside that corporation. And you can see Main Street, Main Street, Main Street, and some new urbanism. The model shows you what's going on. I'm like, what the hell did you all do? So their highest value per acre, the most wealth that they're cultivating is, is eight million an acre. All of these places are less dense. And just to kind of rub it in a little bit, we put the three counties side by side of, of Nashville, Austin, and Lawrenceville, and we ran an economic heart monitor. And um, <laughs> all right, so I got a pulse of 192 million here, 476 million here, and well, you're all flatlining today. And I asked them, I'm like, you guys have all the same horizontal infrastructure as these places, yet they've got some wealth to pay for it. You guys don't. Are you going broke? And they're like, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's be honest. You know, I love this quote, a government that robs from Peter to pay Paul can always be a, depend on the support for Paul. That there's a reality of politics that's going on in which those two people that are subsidized are gonna keep on asking for that subsidy. That's cool. Let's just account for it, right? So realize that our tax code is driving a lot of this. Moses didn't deliver it to us. We can change it. Um, tax systems change the physical environment in other places. This is uh, Normandy and which you were taxed on the footprint of your building. So people started building out and projecting over the streets, and they eventually threw the tax policy out. In England, you were taxed on the windows that you had. So people started boarding up the windows to avoid taxes, they just threw the tax system out. France, taxed below your roof line. So they put stories up in the roof, and when the tax assessor came out, they're like, oh, this is clearly the roof right here, you can't tax me. <laughs> I think we have a challenge in this organization to take this on, much in the way that we took on zoning ordinances, much in the way that we took on transportation policies, and we need to make our financial policies of our communities part and parcel of the conversation. You know, we need to understand this stuff and not be afraid of those numbers. So put simply, we've got a financial model that has incentives built in it. If you tax on value, which is what all property taxes are, there's a perverse incentive for building junk. So think about this. I've got carrots, the carrots, and I've got potato chips, right? My carrots are priced at $50 a stock. My potato chips are priced at 10 cents a bag. How do you think the consumer is going to respond to that financial model? They're going to buy potato chips, right? So if we account for that and say, okay, well, at least I know the fat content of my potato chips, I should understand the content and choices of different development patterns and figure out what I can afford and what I can handle and how much fat intake we can take on a daily basis. So people get obsessed about data or big data and then like there's some magic pill that we can take about how the information works. I, I want you to realize everything that we've shown you is hiding in plain sight. We're using assessor's files and map data. It's real simple. Don't overthink this stuff. And back to Charlie for a second. You know, another quote that he has here, and this is maybe a little harsh. He says, Christ, it didn't seem to matter. Black or white, liberal or conservative, white collar or blue, nobody could run shit. And it wasn't just Detroit. Sacramento, Washington, D.C., Wall Street. 
the entire country was be, would be run into the ground by a generation infected by incompetence and greed. Now, I'm not going to go ahead and go that far to say that we're being incompetent by not looking at this stuff, but I, I, I think we have a challenge to get over that we think this is too hard, that the data doesn't exist. The data is there. You know, just challenge yourself to dig a little deeper and bring that data to the conversation to at least help the conversation. Realize that my city is worth all of your professional sports teams combined, right? Or more, maybe closer to home, we're about uh, 30 Cleveland Cavaliers. And I can tell you Dan Gilbert knows LeBron James towel bill, right? The cups in our nightclub cost five cents a pop for the plastic cups. We need to be conversant about what things cost when we talk about urban patterns and what the cost of suburban patterns are. And you need to do the math. Thank you. Q&A, so if anybody wants to ask any questions, um, throw away. Have you had a public sub? Have I had what? A public sub. A public sub? What's that? <laughs> okay. In the back? So the question is, if if you've got if you're already suburbanized and developers want to keep on doing that, how do you how, how do you initiate the conversation or how do you deal with that conversation? And is it worth just continuing the pattern? Um, there's a couple of ways, at least from our perspective, the way that we handle that conversation. For one is, we, we, could you imagine if you said to the developer like, "Hey, hey, Mr. or Miss Developer, you're right. We shouldn't do any math." We should just go ahead and just let you do what you want and not see what's in it for our end at our business perspective. And no developer is going gonna, is gonna to think that that's rational. You have to get them in the conversation and say, I understand that you're a developer and your company is worth $15 million. That's cool. My city is worth $60 million or $60 billion. You know, Asheville, I gave you the taxable value. That's $12.8 billion. Let's say $13 billion will round up. That's just the taxable value. When you add in the city streets, the, the city's infrastructure, city hall, all of that stuff, the cost of what you all own, or what we own, that's another 25 billion. So my city of Asheville is worth somewhere north of 35 billion dollars. So you say to Mr. Developer, like, okay, that's cool, you're a 15 million dollar company, we're a 35 billion dollar corporation that has to stay financially feasible, and right now we're upside down financially. So if you're asking us to give away more money, we're going to have a public conversation about what we can afford. And you just have to allow us to do that. And if it's good, if it's good, if my community is cool with subsidizing you in addition to everybody else that we subsidized, then cool, that's their choice, that's their vote. But we are obligated at a fiduciary level to keep this place afloat, to keep this corporation going into the future. And that's one way of handling it that's, that's a direct business approach to it. Um, the other way of, of talking about it is, um, you know, in, in a... Um, Gwinnett County, one of the things that, that they said is like, well, we know we want to urbanize, but we've got all this suburban stuff. And we, we said to them, we said, well, is it, is it more expensive to urbanize now? And they're like, oh yeah. So think of it, put another way, it's, if, you're gonna, if you figured out that you're gonna put carpet down, is it easier to put the carpet down before you put your furniture in the room or after? Right, so now that they've already had all of this development all over the place, now they're trying to figure out how to urbanize. I'm not saying everybody's going to be urban or that everybody has to live downtown. That would be illogical and also very counterproductive for the conversation. But if we just say, look, we've got 80% suburban, we need to focus on that 20% urban. Because that's still going to be inside our marketplace. So I'd recommend to do a market analysis of how much we choose that in the marketplace. It's different in all the places, but it's somewhere between 30 and 20% of your, your market. 
but why would those people be left out of the market? And then there's other courses that'll happen throughout the week here of suburban retrofit and some other examples where you can do that selective surgery. I don't know if that helps answer your question. Yeah, you've explained how essentially downtowns pay for themselves and the newer suburban areas don't, but how much of that is a result of the added value of urbanism and how much of that is a result of the fact that the suburban areas are more residential and residential never pays for itself? I'd say yes. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it's, a, it's a simple factor of, of the value of the architecture, um, the value of the infrastructure. Um, I mean, I don't know how to answer that. It's just, if your question is, the suburban stuff, we know it doesn't pay for itself. Well, yeah, but you have to show it to people. You know, that people think that it's a free market choice to move into those areas, it's not free. There's a cost to that of future generations. Just, just be conscious of that. Um, I like to use the analogy of uh, my family's uh, medical history. So I, my family has a predisposed uh, issue with heart disease. I like eating hamburgers. I'm Italian, I eat a lot of pizza. You know, there's like a lot of bad foods that I shouldn't be eating, but I have to keep it in check, you know? And so development patterns are the same thing, is that you're gonna have these things that don't make economic sense. Just keep it in check and understand that, that it, that it is a social corporation. In the case of Lafayette, um, there are poor neighborhoods that produce more revenue than some of the wealthier neighborhoods when you net it out, but they're still less productive than some of their urban counterparts. And that's just something you have to be aware of, that the poor are always with us, and you need to help that part of your community out. So it's going to be financially upside down, but not nearly as upside down as something further out. Um, Jonathan Rose, who's doing a presentation in a couple of days, has this great economic model of uh, just simple, old-fashioned urbanism in its environmental productivity versus green suburbanism. And the numbers are there. Just use the math. Sir? Um, so in Detroit, uh, almost all of the new developments that have been done that you're looking at downtown and throughout the city are done with tax payments. Uh, the incentives you know, to cut the taxes, property taxes in Detroit are very high. So I, I don't think there's a single project I've worked on that did not have these tax payments that cut the taxes for these projects way down. And you know, based on what you're saying, I mean, have you dealt with that in other cities? And, you know, it, 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 based on that, it kind of looks like that's a really bad idea. Um, so the question is about tax abatements in Detroit. Almost all the properties that you've looked at have some form of tax abatement in order to not overtax somebody out of their house. There's a lot of cities, particularly in the Rust Belt, Buffalo, we did analysis there. Um, most of upstate New York, it's almost like they negotiate everybody's tax bill on a, a pay-as-you-go system. Um, when you get into a a situation of the drain that happened at the scale of Detroit or Buffalo or Syracuse. Um, you have to be prudent about what money you have left. Um, abatement is a really, it, it, it works, but it also perpetuates a problem. You know, the, the people that are there can't afford the city that they're in. The, the, the suit that they bought is way too big. Um, now, the, the, the thing about, I'll just, I'll just use Buffalo because we did that, that math. What was scary in the analysis that we saw is Buffalo was still suburbanizing. Buffalo also gets, um, Erie County gets 30% of its revenue from the state to keep the, the city of the county afloat. So they're using that money to just basically expand their liability. And I think the state should step in and say, okay, you're not using our money wisely, you know. Um, they've, they've got an interesting program there where they have, uh, like, university students can buy a house for a dollar. And so at least keeps them in the community, and it makes that house stay active. And eventually they'll nurse them up to being a full-rate full taxpayer. But you have to think differently about it and do, and do the math the way you can afford. Detroit's already having and wrestling with those conversations about can it actually abandon neighborhoods and cut off streets. And that's a really tough conversation you all are having, and it's not working that positively because you're asking people to uproot, and they're the only ones that are hanging on in that neighborhood. But that's something that you're, like, back to, this book again, you're wrestling with problems that a lot of America is going to be facing in the future when they lose the, that, that first wave of growth. So as you wrestle with it, I mean, I think that we're going to be looking to you for examples. We have uh, time for, I think, one more question. A lot of times uh, neighborhoods fight density. 
Have you ever heard of a city saying, showing this kind of analysis and, and sharing in some of the upside on the taxes as a, as a give to the debate, say yes? So the question is, a lot of communities fight density, and have we seen this model used as a way to kind of contribute into the community? Um, that's a lot of the like the um, the road project, where you did the rehab value of that street, also the, uh, the the grocery store example. Effectively, those are um, called value capture or tax increment financing, and that's a standard used in a lot of cities. We just don't say those words because we don't want to overly nerdy make the presentation. So it's getting people at a regular level to understand that you're in the system cooperatively and that you should be having that conversation. The same way with tax abatement. You should also have the conversation about tax abatement. You've got to account for it and figure out where that tipping point is at which point you go broke. But um, just making the, the money part of the conversation. We already went broke. Well, yeah. <laughs> then don't repeat those problems. <laughs> But, uh, but thank you. I'll be around all week until Sunday, so I'll see you around.